Oh, hello! My name is Mara, and welcome to Books Like Whoa. Project Poirot rolls on again this week, this time with Mrs. McGinty's Dead slash Blood Will Tell. Okay, so we've got to just take a moment and say that this is yet again, and I didn't, I don't think I brought this up uh, last week for Crooked House, because it's also in this camp. Mrs. McGinty said apparently is some sort of like British rhyming thing or British like children's word game. I was not aware of that. I'd for I had never read this one before. I was not aware of that prior to reading this book. And Agatha, you have got to take a chill pill with these nursery rhymes or sayings or whatever. Like I just, I can't with this. But anyway, Crooked House was that way too because there's like a little rhyme about little crooked man lived in a little crooked house. Anyway, I get, I mean, I guess I gotta just let her have this, but it just, I'm getting to the point where I'm like, seriously, can we just like pick something different? Anyway, now that my little rant about her naming is over. Um, this is just a little disclaimer for my Project Para videos. I do not do spoilers in terms of the plot. I will take you up to roundabouts where we find a body, which it's a murder mystery, I feel like that's fair. And then I will also talk about characters in, in some depth um, in terms of like their details of their personalities and, and different things that they, like how they factor into things, but nothing that I think would diminish anybody who hadn't read the books before enjoyment of the book. So um, do with that with you, as you will, that's, that's your warning. So with that said, let's get into a little synopsis. This is one where Poirot has been like retired-ish for some time. He is getting very bored in his retirement and uh, is sort of like moping around complaining about that one day <laughs> to himself when Superintendent Spence, uh, who we met I believe in Taken at the Flood, is uh, like comes by to visit him and basically says, look, there's this case, which Paro reads about briefly in the paper earlier on, but there's this case, um, this old woman who was like a cleaning woman, basically, and a landlady, Mrs. McGinty, was killed allegedly by her tenant, James Bentley, and he has been found guilty and he is going to be executed, but, but Superintendent Spence is basically like, I just don't think he did it because usually murders, murderers are somewhat cocky and this guy is the opposite of that. He is like morose depressed he seems like he almost wants to die and I just don't think he did it but because of like the capacity that I'm in and he's I think about to retire I can't really reopen this so like would you mind going and checking things out and seeing like what's what and Poirot is kind of bored and he's intrigued by the the description that that Spence gives him so he's like okay cool I'll go and check this out in a little town called Broad Henny and for my fellow Drag Race fans and every time this name comes up in my mind I said Broad Henny so anyway side note but anyway all that to say <laughs> so he goes to Broad Henny Henny and um and starts investigating basically and I don't really want to do much more than that because like the main, I mean, it's in the title, Mrs. McGinney's dead. And also like the main murder is hers and that has happened prior to the book starting. So basically this is Poirot trying to prove that James Bentley did not do this. And there's a lot, a lot of people who might have had motive to do this. And let me just give you a rundown. Like I had to write them down because I was so just like, oh my God, there's so many people. Okay, so we've got, who all do we have here? The Summer Hayes. So the Summer Hayes are uh, Maureen and John, I think. Is that his name? Yeah, Johnny. They own like a house, a guest house that Poirot actually stays in. And there's a lot of like kind of comic relief ish in the book of him like trying to eat her terrible food. So they they are on the scene and they possibly might have had a motive. I should say part of how so many people are involved in this is because Mrs. McGinty was a cleaning lady and basically known for being a snoop and Poirot quickly comes to believe that she found out something that somebody was silencing her about. So I'll give you that as part of the plot too. So that's why there's so many people because she was cleaning for so many people and like there's just a lot of people who she could have been snooping on. So the Summer Haze is one. Then we have, oh God, who else do we have? We have, okay, Guy Carpenter and Eve Carpenter. And they are basically like rich people who she was cleaning for. And I think he's the, I think he's like the richest guy in Broad Henny. And he also is sort of like politically ambitious. And she, we quickly come to kind of figure out has some kind of secret she's trying to keep 
under wraps. So they possibly could have done it. We have um, Maude Williams, who works for a, a local business and is a friend of James Bentley. And she wants to help Poirot, but she's kind of doing it in a weird way. And it's a little bit suspicious. So she's kind of in the mix. The Birches, so Bessie Birch is Mrs. McGinty's niece and she inherited her entire savings of 230 pounds. Um, so in theory, that's a motive though Poirot, I don't think is all that suspicious of her. We've got Laura Upward, who is like this rich jerk basically. Um, and Mrs. McGinney was cleaning for her. And then she has a son named Robin Upward. And we'll get into the problems with Robin's character, but basically they have like a very affected way of talking to each other that really makes Poro homophobic and uncomfortable. <laughs> um, and so they have kind of a weird dynamic and Poirot feels like there's something going on there. We've got the Rendell. So Dr. Rendell is like the only, another recurring theme in this book is that constantly people are not recognizing Erko Poirot and he's getting all up in his feelings about that. But Dr. Rendell actually does uh, uh, notice Poirot and then he also has a wife and when he starts poking around with them, they get very, very defensive and she starts talking about letters that she's gotten and like, Poirot sort of like, what the fuck? Um, so they're in the mix. Who else do we have? We have the Weatherbees, who are another, like nobody is actually that nice. Anyway, the Weatherbees are, are in the mix. She's an invalid. And then she has a daughter named Deirdre from a previous marriage who is in love with James Bentley, but they're very controlling of her and they would not want her to marry him. So, you know, could they have like framed him for something to get her away from him maybe. And that's, so okay. So I think that that's most of like the people that you need to know about with the exception of, we also get Erin Ariadne Oliver back in this book. So if you remember, she is in Cards on the Table in her first appearance. And she's kind of like an Agatha Christie stand-in. She's a mystery writer. She's fabulous. She's like super spacey and very like, she's just a lot of fun. Anytime she shows up in a book, she she's sort of like a delight and an enjoyable person to be around. So. I think that's all the characters we need to talk about. Like I said, mostly we're trying to figure out who killed Mrs. McGinty. There is at least one other death in this book. And uh, yeah, we we find out who done it at the end. So let's get into first some of my feelings and then some analysis. So the good news is there's actually a lot to talk about in this book. The bad news is I really did not enjoy it. So this was the first time I'd actually read this book, um, which is rare in Project Poirot because usually these are rereads, but this was actually a first read for me. I had not been spoiled for it, so I did not necessarily know who did it. I pretty quickly, well, no, not that quickly, but I, I definitely knew who had done it. Um, by the time we get to the second murder, I didn't know necessarily why. I was a little confused about that, but um, I had suspicions about who had done it. And mm -hmm. I didn't love the solution to this because I feel like, I don't know, I just didn't feel like it was that satisfying of a solution. I mean, it was, it had like some ingenuity to it, I guess, but I just didn't, I don't know, I didn't really like the solution to this too much. And there was just some like problems with this in terms of like what I perceive as like homophobia in this book. And I don't know if that's exactly what she was going for. It may have been, so like I mentioned this earlier, but Robin Upward is a, like a theater guy. I think he's a director if I remember rightly. And he's just described as like the stereotypical sort of like effeminate, like limp wrists, wristed is sort of the word that I want to use here. Like he's portrayed basically as gay, I think, or like very metrosexual. And like just the attitude of the author and the attitude of Poirot just seems to be very like, you know, probably correct for the time, but like ignorant and not fun. And like, I didn't enjoy reading about that. And I, I just didn't, I didn't like that. And maybe, you know, again, it's probably of the period. So to some degree, it's not like I'm hating Agatha Christie for having that. It's just, it's not, it makes it so it's not enjoyable for me to read. I also just, there were so many characters in this that I felt like it was hard to really connect with any one of them because there's just so many. And there's so many people, like, because there's also this, um, like in terms of like the motive, I don't want to get into that too much, but like there's even more people involved with the motive that you're trying to keep track of. And it's just like, it's too much. There's too much going on. And I just couldn't get into it really. Like I just didn't, I just didn't really enjoy it that much. Um, I don't think it was badly written or anything like to contrast this with something like Taken at the Flood where I didn't really enjoy it. I, I think that there were some writing issues in that one. I don't necessarily think that's the case here. I think it's a, um, 
it's a perfectly good Christy. And if you've read a lot of Hercule Poirot before, you probably would be fine with this, like in terms of maybe it wouldn't irritate you that much. But I, this is definitely not one that I would recommend people start with because I just think that he's quite off-putting in this one. And I just think in general, it's not, I just didn't, I just didn't like it. That's what it boils down to. But it's not the worst one I've read. And like I said, I think it's a perfectly accomplished Christy. It just didn't connect with me and I did not like the solution. So anyway, there's, that being said, there's a lot to talk about in this one. So I'll do that. So there's so many directions I could take this because I think that there's, yeah, there's just a lot, there's a lot here. There's a lot of there there. Um, a couple of things about post-war conditions. So I think what's most notable in this particular book is uh, housing post-war conditions. And the fact that um, because, so a combination of a ton of housing being lost during World War II because of all the bombings. So we have a lot of houses have gone away entirely or been very, very damaged, coupled with the lack of money has made there be a huge housing shortage in England. And so for, for instance, after Mrs. McGinty is dead, she, like someone immediately jumps into that house and there's some, some kind of uh, discussion about the fact of like, yeah, it may have, you might think that somebody being murdered in a place would be off putting to new tenants, but they're like, we're trying to get out of our parents' house. We've had to live with them. Like we will deal, we'll clean up that blood and like <laughs> make it work. So I think it's interesting in that respect. And in terms of like what, like what, um, how people were having kind of take what they could get in terms of housing. There's also interesting discussion in terms of, um, the ongoing shift of classes in England that was definitely accelerated by the Second World War, um, where it's very difficult to get, the serving class basically is, is quickly disappearing. And the upper classes who are used to having them at their disposal, um, there's a lot of complaints about that in this book and how you can't get good help. And, you know, Mrs. McGinty was a snoop and maybe not even that great, but like she showed up consistently and that was enough for people. You definitely see Agatha Christie's sort of like classism and sort of like snobbery in her discussions of this because she very explicitly, I believe in her autobiography, I'll find out soon, um, talks about how she essentially thinks the serving class loves serving and that that was like what they're made for and isn't that great. And yeah, I'm not sure that <laughs> that's so much the case. Um, it's a little wishful thinking on her part, I think. But anyway, that, that class is evaporating and uh, it's harder and harder for people to find good servants. Um, so... I think that's interesting too. And that, that was something that actually started happening after World War I, but was, I mean, essentially the serving class is on its last breaths by the, by the 50s. One other kind of just general thought or note um, about the post-war period is the sort of meditation on food that Poirot has at the beginning of the novel. So he's sort of thinking through how in retirement everybody gets a hobby and really his is eating and eating well. Um, food was was hard to come by in this period in terms of variety and in terms of anything considered a luxury and luxury in this case includes things like eggs. So the fact that Poirot is able to dine regularly so op like opulently speaks to the level of wealth that he has at this point in his, his career and his life. And it's just also an interesting commentary in general on uh, the cooking, uh, like British cookery. Um, and there's a lot, you know, Internationally, the stereotype is is that British food is terrible. Um, I studied abroad in Cambridge, so I you know had a good a good chunk of time of eating British food, and I would disagree with that. I think that at least today, at least when I was there, there's plenty of delicious food. Now a lot of it is international, but like hey, if it's winter time, a pasty sounds delicious. Like basically, it's a portable chicken pot pie. I mean, I did not have a problem with the quality of the food, but. That is a stereotype and it's something that, that Poirot is always complaining about is British food and then he has like this huge, like there's this huge comedic subplot of him trying to eat the Summer Haze food. Um, so I just, it's interesting though because a huge part of how that stereotype developed is that an entire gener like an entire um, tradition of British cooking was lost in, during the World Wars because of the number of, because of food rationing and also the number of like prominent chefs who did not pass on their trade. I forget, I've read an article about this at some point, but anyway, as a side note, like it's interesting that that's the stereotype for British food because really what we have today as British food is so like, it's so diminished from what it was at one point because it didn't get passed down the same way. And um, I think maybe I was reading this in connection with the Great British Bake Off, but just that like in the last 20 years or so, there's been kind of, A, there's been a ton of internet, like 
prominent international cuisine that is getting better and better. But also, so like, you know, a curry or whatever is, is now kind of the, the, the British staple. Um, but also just like a re, um, a renewed interest in sort of like traditional uh, British cooking and kind of trying to revive some of that. So anyway, just as a side note, if you're ever giving the poor <laughs> Brits a hard time about the fact that their food isn't good, one, I would challenge that because I don't think it's nearly as bad as people talk about it being. And two, like there, there's a reason why some of that happened and it has to do with the world wars. So just a side note and in, in defense of British cooking. And then just a couple of uh, thematic notes. So I think I mentioned this in my schedule update for you guys, but Originally, the reason why I wanted to include a Caribbean mystery uh, into as a detour in Project Poirot was because there's this protracted kind of beginning um, meditation from Miss Marple in that book about how mores are changing and how times are changing and sensationalized death and murder is kind of on the rise or is like being glamorized. And actually we have a very similar meditation about that at the beginning of this book with Poirot and he's kind of thinking back to the good old days, um, but also just sort of, uh, he, he's very directly commenting on the changing culture that he's seen over the course of his time in England. So I just thought that that was really interesting and worth noting that um, Christy is, because uh, A Caribbean Mystery only comes out, I think, a couple of years after this. She's reaching a point in her life where I think she's directly reflecting on how much cultural change she has witnessed. And I mean, she is, she was born, I think, in the 1880s. So like by the 1950s, that that's a lot of history to have experienced, right? Um, and a lot of change to have seen. So he definitely has some like kind of direct commentary about that that I thought was really interesting um, and something I think worth noting. And I, I wanna kind of like watch this space because I think she increasingly is willing to sort of, or not willing, she increasingly is kind of talking about how much things have changed. And I don't think that we had as much discussion of that in earlier novels, but she's, you know, in I think her 70s at this point, and like that's 60s or 70s, whatever. That's kind of the right time of life to be looking back and kind of making note of these things. So I wanted to point that out. And then the other thing I just wanted to point out because I thought this was such a great observation and I was like, you go Agatha, this is probably the part of the book I enjoyed the most was that basically what Poirot says when he comes to Broadhenny is that it is a it's a village full of nice people and that that actually somewhat increases the risk of somebody being murdered because nice people don't want anything not nice to ever be associated with them. And I thought that that was a, and that they can be kind of ruthless with making sure that doesn't happen. And I thought that was such an interesting observation that sometimes <clears throat> like, you know, in the news when someone has been killed or whatever, like the commentary is like, oh, I never, you, you know, you never would have thought he was such a nice guy. And basically what she's saying is that if you are in a social situation where your niceness is at a premium and that that is kind of what your social acceptance and your position is contingent on is being nice, that can create a kind of ruthlessness because um, you will do what it takes to not let anybody think you're not nice. And this is, I think she's particularly associating this with women and it, that's just such a astute observation because women have so much pressure on us. Like we are socialized to have people perceive us as being good girls and being nice and being helpful. And that if you have anything in your life that is not associated with those things, you run the risk of being labeled a slut or a ditz or what, or, there's just so many ways that nice girls can become not nice. And in this book, most of the suspects are female. And it's just interesting, I think, that she makes that kind of explicit connection for us. And that that's sort of the angle that Poirot is coming at this case from, which is these are nice people whose very niceness is part of what could make them ruthless in terms of if Mrs. McGinty found something out about them that they didn't want to come out that could be kind of a, a, a dangerous situation. So I just thought that that was a very interesting observation from Agatha Christie. But anyway, if you've read this, definitely let me know what you think of it. Um, if you think I just missed some great part of it that diminished my enjoyment, feel free to let me know. Um, but anyway, aside from that, if you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, follow me on the social meds if you are so inclined. I have all that information listed in the description box below. And I think that will do it. I hope you guys are having a really wonderful day and I will talk to you soon. Bye.